So the next project, just to give you guys a little rundown, as you can see, I'm starting to put out YouTube specific videos. So I've already put out three videos on puzzle solving. So I'm gonna be recording, I'm gonna be trying to do a video a day on various topics. So the next one is gonna be, I'm gonna to try to refute another gambit. Now, I wanna, I wanna know this, the, the refuting gambit series, that's gonna continue. Um, is there something that you guys would like to see? Like, is there any particular gambit or anything you would like to know how to play against? All right, Enro, no plus seven, so this is not gonna be the last game. All right, so we have a French. Let's play another, um, you know, as we say, the, not that Peter needs any more ego, but the Giannato's French. Um, now you guys should already know what that entails, right? The normal move is C3 here. But the way that we have played this, the last couple of Frenches, is this weird-looking move, knight f3. Knight c6. And now, does anybody remember the proper continuation here, if we are playing in the spirit of the gambit? Who can remember Who can remember the move here? It's, it's not c3, so that's the whole point. We're avoiding c3. So we simply develop as if nothing is happening. So if you look at this bishop on f1, we want to develop this bishop, and we go bishop d3. Now, why not bishop b5? That's something I will explain after the game. It's a very, very common mistake in these positions to go bishop b5. Okay, c takes d4. So, now we castle. We're just developing our pieces, and f6 is one of the main lines. All right, so, a um, couple of things here. The whole, the zen of... The system here for white is to establish full control over the e5 square. If we lose control of the e5 square, then uh, black's pieces start to rumble, or sorry, black's pawns start to rumble up the board, right? So what we do not want to do is just take on f6 and relinquish our control over that square. We don't want to do that. So what should we do? Yeah, we should go rook e1 or bishop f4, one of these moves to establish control of that pawn. So rook e1 is what we're going to do because okay now we take the whole point here is that we're maintaining our control over this square knight f6 all right um how should we develop this bishop to um to properly maintain our control of that square where should we go should we go to g5 should we pin the knight don't get distracted by the possibility of pinning the knight Remember what our goal here is. Our goal is not necessarily the one move pins. Our goal is further control of the e5 square. So I believe that even though it looks a little, a little bit lame, bishop f4 positionally is the better decision. Bishop d6. And now we need even further control of the square because the, the whole battle is revolving around our ability to preserve this knight on e5. And I think that if you're thinking about it, how can we involve another piece to defend that knight? Well, we can go queen e2, that's absolutely true, but we also have a piece that we haven't developed yet. So let's try to combine two things in one. Let's try to develop this knight and bring it to a square where it de defends the e5 knight. You guys see what I'm getting at. I think we should play knight d2 and then possibly knight df3. Let's go knight df3. And what to watch for we need to watch this x-ray our bishop is undefended so there are potential discoveries such as knight e4 i don't think they're dangerous but we should be aware of that and one good prophylactic move would be to drop the bishop back to g3 when time permitting of course when we have the opportunity to do so just to make sure the bishop is outside the purview of the rook and is an undefended square it's exactly the same principle as in the london yeah you you establish maximal control over the central square as long as we have control over that square we have compensation for our pawn we've got a great clamp in the center but if we lose control of the square and black pushes that e pawn forward there will be hell to pay yeah i can certainly explain bishop d3 afterwards wouldn't queen to queen d2 hit two birds with one stone in that respect well queen d2 i don't really love because it potentially walks into a skewer and it potentially walks into knight e4. So, I don't know, queen d2 maybe, maybe we'll also play queen e2. It depends on what black does in this position. 
Am I concerned about knight h5? No. Knight h5, I can always just move my bishop back. We've got enough pieces on that. That's why we brought the knight to f3, so that any single piece could depart from its its uh, controlling post and still will still be okay. Knight e4, I think, is the best move. All right, so knight e4. Okay, so let's try to make sense of this position. Um, I've got a couple of options here. Got a couple of options here. Um, I would say that, again, our, our top priority here should be maximum control over the e5 square. So one thing that we could do, we can just play bishop g3 and pretend that nothing is happening. That's interesting. But I think there is a more direct way to play here. I think there is a more direct way to play. I think that we can just capture on c6. B takes c6 is forced because the queen hangs. And now we just take on d6. Wow, queen takes d6. That's surprising. I thought that he would take with a knight. And in that case, we would have brought that other knight out to e5. Okay, so now we play bishop takes e4. And a very common mistake here would be to pre-move rook takes e4. Never pre-move a move unless you are 100% sure that that is the move you should be playing. Always take a couple of seconds just to make sure that you're not missing any interesting opportunities. This is a great example of that. Rook takes e4 looks great. But let's calculate one move further. What happens there? Rook takes c4, black plays c5, and opens up a massive diagonal for that bishop. We're not better there. But what we can do is play the move queen takes d4. This is a typical idea. We're hitting the queen. And in the event of a queen trade, black is left with, you know, black's pawn structure is completely in shambles. So it was a mistake for him not to take on d6 with a knight. Why couldn't we immediately win the pawn? Because if we had taken on e4 here, black would have had the additional option of taking the other bishop, the dark squared bishop. So we had to take on d6. Now we're better. Okay, that I could have pre-moved. And let's see if we can take this all the way to the end. C5. All right, where to go with the knight? Um, again, the priority should be, I mean, we, we would like to win some of these pawns if possible, uh, but we don't want to just aimlessly move to a square that looks good. We want to be very targeted in our, in our maneuvers. So I, I think knight b3 is the best because it hits this pawn. And if the pawn goes forward, the further forward it goes, the weaker it becomes. We can go knight a5 or knight d2. Not scary. Simon with a full year of subbing. Thank you, sir. Much appreciated. Okay, rook b8. Good move. 30 bucks for miasma. Oh my god. Damn. We are getting lit tonight. Rook takes c4, and this also conveniently stops the move pawn to c4. And there come the first material losses for black. And he just resigns. Yep. Um, probably not even that premature. The position is just lost. Um, the position is just lost. So, good game. All right. So, again, if you've watched the speedrun before, you should be familiar with this, this line that, that I've played the last couple times we faced the French. Um, and the idea is to accelerate... White's development. Originally, it was played by Aaron Nimzovich. And uh, the way that I would explain the idea is everything revolves around the e5 pawn. Um, the main drawback of the French is that, that you, allow this, you allow this pawn to drive itself to e5. That, in turn, locks up that bishop on c8. That's why you get the French bishop. And black is lacking in space, number one. Number two, black has a hard time developing his kingside pieces to natural squares. Um, now, when there's a very strong pawn like this, and that pawn is traded, there's often a weak square that emerges in its in its stead, right? So for in its stead. So for example, you saw that in this game. When black plays f6 and then takes on e5, that's a potential outpost, so a pawn can be replaced with a piece. But it's incredibly important not to relinquish that square, because then black sets the pawns in motion, as I explained. Um, no, yeah, so knight c6, bishop d3, 
we also want black to play c4 because then the bishop just drops back and our central pawn chain is no longer under any pressure if that makes sense okay so c takes d4 oh yeah why not bishop b5 so this is a very common mistake at around a 14 1500 level is to play bishop b5 here um where does this mistake come from i think a lot of players let's say below 2000 are overly not obsessed but have a um over overestimate let's just say the power of a pin and something i shared many many months ago when i was first starting the five minute speed run is a, sh a short and quick way of determining whether a pin is dangerous so this is the the pinning piece the bishop uh the king or sorry the knight is the piece that is pinned um and the king is what i call the pinny right p-i-n-e-e -E, just as a way to refer to it um now the key question here is whether the pinned piece is protected by a pawn if a pinned piece is protected by a pawn the pin is generally not as dangerous the most dangerous pins are ones where the pinned piece is not protected by a pawn that way it's incredibly vulnerable and easier to attack um the second thing that you should be asking yourself um when you're pinning something is whether there is a way to apply further pressure on the pin piece and that's that's irrespective of whether there is a pawn defending the pin piece so for instance is there a way to quickly get the queen a4 what happens if you do that is this pin really dangerous so let's take a look at it is it dangerous first of all the knight's defended by the pawn so condition one has already failed but number two black could simply play a6 or black could even play bishop d7 and the pin is no more and you certainly do not want to give this bishop away for the knight for no reason because then the light squares are going to get weak black has a gazillion moves here queen b6 the bishop is very awkward on b5 and even if black plays a6 and you take this pawn structure is not bad as we've discussed many times when you've got doubled pawns one of the pawns could capture on d4 and then the other one could move on to c5 this is actually a very dangerous situation for white so if you play c3 here boom and boom and this is an event a case where double pawns are actually good so i hope that makes sense um pins on the queen side like this are rarely that dangerous so we go bishop d3 the bishop aims at the king side because black is very likely to castle in the future okay so f6 rook e1 fe5 knight e5 five bucks from premier bust thank you and the lucas mita thank you for the three months okay knight f6 bishop f4 f6 is pretty good here i think black is fine uh black was fine all the way until essentially he um played uh, took the wrong way took on d6 with the queen so bishop d6 knight d2 castles and knight df3 um look at how many pieces we have protecting this e5 square and the black goes 94. okay so I actually think knight e4 might be an inaccuracy probably queen c7 was the best move and the computer gives equality so it's a very double-edged position we would have dropped our bishop back to g3 and i would argue that white's position is easier to play even if it's objectively equal white's got all these really healthy and nice improving moves queen e2 rook d1 you could try expanding on the queen side but black uh, is really clamped down so in order to play these positions well black has to know a series of of um french specific maneuvers and one of them is to try to get this bishop around to h5 this is a very common idea in the french so bishop d7 queen e2 and maybe bishop e8 the problem here is that e6 pawn is very weak so the moment black relinquishes control of it play knight takes e6 and here we win a piece so that's not possible sorry black might have to go rook a8 but now this bishop on d7 has no no good home so um I, I hope this makes sense uh, white has full compensation for the pawn and so it's entirely possible that from a practical standpoint the system where black plays bishop c5 and then bishop d7 and either delays or doesn't play f6 at all is easier to play for black than this one okay so f6 rook e1 blah 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 knight e4 and now we take take and take and the funny thing is after knight takes d6 the computer just says that we should play knight takes d4 with an advantage because this is actually a fork and um, after queen f6 a very instructive position arises 
Um, what should white do? We have two candidate moves, right? Black threatens potentially to take one of these two pieces. The key question is, should we take on c6 or sh should we prefer some other move? So let's answer the question, should we take on c6? A lot of you say no. But what if I were to tell you that the answer is yes, we should take on c6 and I'm not trolling. Now you guys are looking at this saying, what the hell is wrong with you? Why would you ever allow queen takes f2? And the fear of checks, I think the reason you're probably disgusted at this is because I think a lot of players have a fear of the opponent capturing something with check. This is a very specific fear and I've noticed this even in students or masters. The fear of opponent capturing a piece or a pawn with check um, and it's very easy to blow that out of proportion in your mind. But look at what happens after king h1. Who does the opening of the f file actually benefit? Well, think about that for a second. Black is not developed. Black is passive. Our bishop's aimed at the king. Queen h5 is threatened. And we're threatening to go rook f1 and create massive pressure down that f file. So for instance, after bishop d7, here we would go queen h5. And black is already losing. Black has already lost g6 and... Now we can go knight e7 check, or we can go bishop takes g6. This is the best. King g7, whoop, taking the knight on d6. Um, so this is, um, this is a good example of where taking on f2 is entirely not dangerous. Well, rook f1 is threatened right now because black's rooks are not coordinated. Um, do I have any illustrative examples of when I did something like this. I do. Rook f1, queen c5 is the only move over queen b6, yeah. Let me see if I can find it. So this was a game which I butchered, even though I was winning. But um, it's very, very sad that I butchered this game because it was one of my better, one of my best uh, attacking games, and then I screwed it up in the end, unfortunately, but it still... This is my game against Shabala from the 2017 US Championship. And we reached this very sharp position in a classical Sicilian. Okay. So what's going on here? Well, I've castled, black hasn't. Black's king is clearly in quite some trouble. This knight on h5 is a really strong attacker. And here I was able to find a really powerful move. And if you, if you know anything about the classical Sicilian, this move should probably occur to you. Um, Generally, this, this is more common when, when white has a pawn on e4. How do we generally break apart black's pawn's pawn bumper here? How do we, how do we usually approach it? What, what typical move do we have in such positions? And again, usually when we have a pawn on e4. Yeah. So the move f5, and I played it anyway. And the reason is that after bishop takes f5, this is just horrendous for black. Knight g7. And well, black has Irish pawns, and this is just absolutely atrocious. So it works tactically. And if black plays e5, the point is that the d5 square is weakened. Sorry, no, we don't go rook d5. But we can go bishop c4, and just positionally, black is unable to cover the square. Okay, but if you look even more carefully, f5 looks like a huge blunder. What? Why does it look like a blunder? What, what move does black have here? So rook c8, yeah, rook c8. Rook c8, and um, it looks like white, white is busted, because if the queen moves, then bishop takes c2 check, and not only is it a capture with a check, but also the rook is low. But I was able to calculate further than that. Queen e3, he takes, and king a1. And the point is that if bishop takes d1, there's bishop b5 check, and queen h6 with checkmate. So the attack rages on, this bishop is entirely innocuous, and after rook c5, I calmly move the rook away. My king is perfectly safe. If anything, he did me a favor by sending the king over to a1. The white's attack is decisive here, but in the end, I, I screwed it up. I had a one-move win. But, but in any case, the reason I showed this game is just to show you that these moves are not always to be feared. Sometimes you have to calculate a little bit deeper than just 
that move where your opponent takes something with check. Okay, so back to the game. Yeah, after queen d6, I think the rest is pretty simple. Queen takes d4. Um, rook b8 was another mistake. Probably c4 gave more practical chances, but after knight c5 or knight a5, um, white is technically winning here. So again, the system works even at a pretty high level, and uh, something that you can definitely consider playing. I'll probably make a video on it at some point. All right, well, we got one more game in the speedrun left. I'm going to leave that one for tomorrow, guys. I'm pretty tired. It's late. I'm going to hit the sack, and I also want to raid min. Thank you, everybody.